Okay. We left off in the Das Funos where there's a conversation between the soul and the intellect. When the soul says, in terms of to be able to grasp and understand where things are going, just read the words again. Arman Neshama, Hamasibos Hagados, Hamishabchos Ba'olam. All the manifestations and what evolves in this world. Hamaros Tomid Lachora Hepech Hashkoch Hashkoch. We see many things which seemingly are contradictory to divine providence. Koshim Shein Asvora Roe Sofin Yonim Bechane Magim. And even when we see things, we don't see where they're going to end. Meaning we're too limited to be able to grasp and see why things are the way they are. Why does God put us in such a quandary and such a state of confusion where it seems we're being punished for going to doing good, a good deed? Now there's an expression in the vernacular no good deed goes unpunished. And it seems to me that's the reality. A person becomes observant, he loses his job. He becomes observant, he tries to do better, he has other issues. It seems to be that there's no rhyme or reason to what goes on in this world. So the events that evolve, that happen, seem to reflect and display things which are contrary that God's in control. What does God want from his creation? Why is he leading us? Why is he willing our existence? Where is it all going to end? If God wants us to appreciate who he is and to see who he is, but God is so is infinite and his presence is so broad, you can't even begin fathoming what exactly he wants from us. So how do we have an approach to enter into this infinite expanse of existence, relatively speaking, and try to have an entry point to be able to see the core and the purpose and the value of all this. We see Rotsish Tlamdenu Derkishora Lahovim Yosher Hanyoni. The soul is asking the intellect, give me an approach, a straight, rational approach, how to understand all these issues, the built in the Tosium Slav, that I should be on that straight and narrow path. You know, it's interesting. I said earlier that why is the world called Olam? It comes from the word Helem, this tremendous con concealment. I want to explain something with a, an allegory. A king builds a palace for his son, the prince, and has every conceivable amenity, beauty, services, everything. And he says to his son, I want you to go visit it and see what it's all about. Except the sconces in the, in the palace that have to be lit to be able to see, to illuminate the palace. The sun not being too bright. He walks in, he doesn't ignite and light these sconces, these torches. And he walks in, what do you think happens? He trips and he hits his arm and he feels he broke his arm and he begins mur mur murmuring under his breath, what did my father give me here? It's a disaster. He picks up himself up, he's writhing in pain, takes another step, he falls down three more steps. He hits his head, he has a gash in his forehead, he's bleeding. But it, within a half an hour, He's already cursing his father. What kind of palace did you build for me? You told me it's magnificent. Everything's here. 
And his father passes by and hears him moaning in pain. His father goes by, he says, what happened? And he says, just what did you, what did you give me here? The whole thing doesn't make any sense. So the father says, did you put on the lights? He never put on the lights to see where you're going. He puts on the lights, he sees, he sees a palace, nothing equal of his palace. But when he went in, he was in the, in the dark. And therefore he tripped and stumbled and he nearly ended his life. The world itself is Helen. It's totally concealed. It's confusion. You know, person, you have what's called night, night goggles, night glasses. That you put them on, you can see despite the lack of the sun, you're able to see even nighttime. The world is dark. The Midrash tells us, it says, it was evening, it was morning. So the Midrash tells us, evening, evening is this the physical world. That's the world to come, that's Yimosa Mashiach. When will everything be clarified and all the pieces of the puzzle fall exactly into place and you understand how, why things have to be, they happened? That's only at the end of time. Right now, we're in a state of confusion. We're short sighted. So, despite our level of short sightedness, how do we illuminate that darkness? Presently, now, to see what seems to be chaotic and contrary to everything we're supposed to believe, despite that, to see it correctly. That's what the soul is asking the intellect. Omar HaSeichel, the intellect responds to the soul. He says, factually, there are other things which are very difficult to grasp and are profoundly deep. Kigon, Tzadik Viralo, person is devoutly righteous and the man doesn't have a good day in his life. Rosh Vitovlo, an evil person, the Midas touch. Whatever he does, God provides all his amenities. Doesn't have a bad day in his life. This question was difficult that even the Chachomim, the wise men of the Gemara, of ancient times, the prophets, even Moshe asked God that question. How do we understand Tzadik Vitovlo, Ralo, and Rosh Vitovlo? It's beyond human grasp. And the way the Ramchal will explain what Moshe couldn't understand, I mean, conceptually, we could understand many things. But the question is why this person, although he said Tzadik, why did God choose him? It should be Ralo. Because you find Tzadik Vitovlo. You find Rosh Vitovlo. So why does this person have this bad predicament, and the other person has a good predicament. But conceptually, you, you could understand why it has to be that way, as he's going to explain. Omra and Shama. And so the soul asked the intellect, I see things which boggle the mind. They're too broad and too deep to understand. And you say to me, they're even more difficult things. The tzaddik, who doesn't have a good day in his life, and the rush who thrives. So what have you answered? You answered a question with a question. So okay, so the whole thing doesn't make any sense. But what's the approach? You know, sometimes you have to see all aspects of the question, and when you have that answer, that answer addresses every part of it. And that's, that's the approach we're taking over here. We don't understand everything. The details that cannot be understood, I'm agreeable to pass on them. But minimally, 
There should be an approach. The general principles should be rational and appropriate to be able to make some semblance in a general sense of, of existence. Sheidal koponim eitzo svoro yishoro. That should know minimally an approach and an understanding which is rational. Addressing everything. I'll give you an example. The smartest man in the world, the greatest heretic. It doesn't bother him why the heart has four chambers. Could he explain why? Why the human being has two legs and two arms and five fingers on each hand? You say, you know why? Because that's what God created man. But why? Why with five fingers? Why with two eyes? Why with two ears? And why with one mouth? Why not two mouths? The answer is because we understand. We have no way to understand why. But areas that we believe we could understand, we want to understand. So if we feel we could understand, we don't, we reject it. You say it's a bunch, bunch of hogwash and nonsense. Because I should understand, I can't. Two arms, two legs, two eyes, one mouth. That's, I don't stand. The creator chose to create. That is the profile of human being. But something which I think I should understand, because the tzaddik is supposed to be that, and there's a constant war and punishment. So how do we, how does it all add up? Seemingly it doesn't. Therefore, the question, unfortunately, becomes an answer. And that's the basis for rejection of Judaism. Anything that I cannot grasp. As it says in Pirkei Obos, Person says, I can't complete the whole Torah. Why start? No. It was never incumbent to, you to study everything. Whatever you could do, do. Do as much as you can. So the soul is saying to the intellect, I understand the many things I don't understand. But whatever I could understand, allow me to understand it. Amra Seichel. The intellect responds. Zebade, without a question. The world was created, it has to function within the context of justice. It has to be equitable justice. Umenage, menago, the mishwat yoshu nemon. And that justice is fair and appropriate and consistent. And he says, and that you could see undisputed, irrefutable. As the faithful shepherd had attested to the fact, the rock is perfect. His action is perfect. All his ways are justice. The faithful God is no iniquity. That's fact. That is God. So if that is him, now we have to try to work it out. But if you can work backwards, first you have to accept the fact. I'll give you an example. You have Albert Einstein. He was the leading physicist in the world at his time. One of the greatest geniuses of the world. And he's already on record. Credibility is that. And somebody who has a, an average IQ goes to a lecture by Einstein. He goes, he doesn't understand the word. Does Kenny grasp the concepts? He says, you know, the man. I went to the lecture. Man babbles. How could you say he's that genius? He's babbling. 
rather than saying I have such limitation. Therefore, I don't understand what he's talking about. Rather than attributing the problem to himself, he attributes it to the speaker, to the teacher, to the professor. That what he says is nonsensical. If you walk in and you don't know anything about that lecturer, and you, it sounds like babbling, so he's babbling. So you're working backwards from what your limitation, you're trying to understand what's a lot bigger than what you are. But if you start with, he is the ultimate, and I am infinitesimal to him, I, and you understand that in advance, then the whole perception of that reality is the perception. God is perfect. Atsur Tom and Polo. His actions are perfect. There's no inequity in his justice. He's faithful to uphold that justice. Once you accept that fact, even if you see things which seem to be contradictory, you put them in context. Because that is fact. I've been teaching Gemara for many years. I've had all kinds of students, Talmudim, whatever the way you want to refer to them. And a lot of them were very smart people. Very advanced educations. Considered leaders in their fields. And they come and study the Gemara. And they say, Rabbi, it doesn't make sense. So my response to them always is, it makes sense. You don't understand. With time, you'll understand. But it's a known fact that the Talmud has no fallacies in logic. That It's a known fact. It's a credible document, no fallacies. So you, even though you have a graduate degree from Harvard, wherever you're coming from, and historically speaking, there are no fallacies in the logic. How could that even come out of your mouth saying it doesn't make any sense? Even though they don't really mean it, but they said, we can't somehow make heads or tails of this. So they said, it doesn't make sense because we should understand it. But if you understand its level of credibility, that the members who said these words were giants, they were genius of geniuses. You don't say it doesn't make sense. You say, I am an amoeba in their presence and I have to try to somehow make some semblance of understanding what they're saying. It's a whole different approach. God is equitable. God is faithful. But what I see, it seems to be contradictory to that. Evidently, you have to find the silver lining in that black cloud. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. I'll give you an example. Howard, you know, they have certain programs. They're called survival camps. People go for six weeks and they teach you survival techniques that if you're lost in the wilderness, despite the fact is you don't have water, you don't have food, you're in a jungle, in the mountains, wherever you are, there's a way to survive. And a person says, and it's tough. It's a tough training program. And the person says, what do I need this for? It doesn't make sense. I don't need it. I could sit at home where I live. It's unnecessary. It's only what happens if the person is displaced and he's forced out of his home, and he goes into a location where he needs his survival techniques. All of a sudden, all those techniques which he was taught take, take on a whole different value. Sometimes when you don't understand something initially, but you know it's true, by working on it, and light starts shining on it, due to the difficulty, when you have the solution, you embrace it and internalize it differently. It's like people used to say, 
If I would have known what Judaism was about 30 years ago, I would have been here a long time ago. It's because of my ego, my arrogance, and my distraction, I wasn't willing to recognize what it is. And I didn't give it its due. If I would have applied myself better and spoken to the right people, I wouldn't have dismissed it. But now that I see what it is, there's not enough time to make up for what I, what I lost due to my own shortcomings. But you have to understand, as he said, you can't understand everything. It's inevitable things you will not understand. I'll give you an example. In Torah, there's Nigla, there's the revealed Torah, there's hidden Torah. The Torah, it says, as it says in Pirkei Ovos, if the Torah is the blueprint for existence, if you go and delve deep enough and broad enough, you can have an understanding of no every aspect of this existence. The spiritual level, the physical level, whatever it is. And you know it's there. But the question, once if you understand its value, even what you don't understand, you accept this fact. It's beyond our capacity. Because just with the little bit I do know, I know there's nothing comparable to it. And it's all encompassing. And if it's all encompassing, when I see the little I know, that gives me understanding that even what I don't know, I don't have to know it to accept it. 